totality. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Is amazing. Oh my gosh. And we are seeing the reaction of the crowd. We are seeing the corona. What is that? Look at this. Look at this. A truly extraordinary day for millions across the country. Almost everyone in the U.S. got a chance to look up at the sky and witness some part of a solar eclipse, a phenomenon that won't be visible again in the United States for another 20 years. I'm Ellison Barber, and this is Stay Tuned Now. The main event of today's solar eclipse, also nicknamed the Great North American Eclipse, was the path of totality, when the moon fully obscures the sun. That's an even rarer phenomenon seen today in only 15 U.S. states, parts of northern Mexico and eastern Canada. The big event drew millions of watchers along the path of totality from Texas all the way up to Maine. Many left emotional after witnessing a truly remarkable moment when the middle of the day looked a lot more like the middle of the night. It's a rare event, right? I mean, why not take a, a chance to see something we may never see again? As they say, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event. The glasses are off. We are in the Umbra. The great North American eclipse is happening right now above us. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's way better than school. Looking forward to this for the last however many years and encouraging all my friends to go. A lot of difficult things to report sometimes, but this is, uh, this is magical. We have team coverage on today's historic event. Solar astrophysicist Amir Caspi is with us. But first, let's go to Dallas, where our very own anchor of this wonderful show, Gotti Schwartz, is. He has gotten to see today's eclipse, not from the ground, but from the sky. Hey, Gotti. Hey, Allison. Yeah, this is the craziest ride I have ever hitched with the company V-Speed. Not just one jet, 
but two jets. This is the Phenom 300, and B-Speed has this camera over here. This camera went all the way up to about 40, 45,000 feet. It is the Red Raptor X, shoots in 8K. They were shooting down over Arkansas. Meanwhile, the path that we were on, this one went uh, just hugging the path of totality. We actually went into totality, and then this part blew my mind. Uh, father and son duo, Jim and James, they're sitting uh, cockpit and co-pilot, and then all of a sudden, James let me have his seat. So we actually got to sit in the cockpit during totality. It was incredible. Take a look. Look at this. Look at this. It's 1 p.m. Wow. Oh my gosh, look at is. that. That is totality, look at that. Oh my God, and you got the stars coming out. Oh, look at, it is, it is a sunset all around us right now. This, this is incredible. We are, what, about 20,000 feet? 20,000 feet, this is our pilot, Jim. Uh, this is Jim's son right here, this is James. James has given me the best seat in the house James I owe you man uh, we've got we've got cities down below and the cities are starting to turn on their lights I, the, the sensors must be set uh, for when it gets dark but it is incredible it is it is this wild sunset sunrise all the way around and then above us you've got you've got that perfect perfect ring when you're up here and you see, you see the movement of this shadow. Shadow is, is very dark on this side, very light on this side. And then up above, you've got that perfect ring. You are just, you're reminded of how fast the moon and the sun are moving. 1600 miles an hour is how fast the moon shadow is moving over Earth. It is wild, wild to see. It's kind of like colder outside. I'm starting to cross over the window. Yeah. This right here, it's kind of freezing over. Freezing over, wow. One of the things that, that's striking up here is just, it's it's this cosmic coincidence, if you will. This cosmic coincidence that is, the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon. 400 times bigger. And then the moon is 400 times further away from the sun uh, than we are. We, it, it's for 400 times further away, and so that, perfect little coincidence enables us to see this totality and that totality is finally starting to lift oh my gosh this is glorious look at this wow now it's like this sunrise but the but the sunrise is a color i've never seen before it is like a, a deep purple this is incredible and what a happy coincidence a happy coincidence that reminds us all that these celestial bodies above us are moving at these incredibly fast speeds, these speeds that we can't even compute. And they're happening every single day, just shows us how, how special we are in this universe. And uh, it's crazy to think that everybody down there on Earth, everybody in that shadow, as that shadow moves on, it is, it is looking up, sharing this majestic moment. And we're up here looking down on Earth. It is, uh, it's a, a life life-changing experience. Incredible. And now, dun -da -da -dun, for the big reveal, what this camera captured right here. You want to see it? Here it is. It looks like it was shot from space. This is over Arkansas. It's crazy because that shadow, that moon shadow that you see, normally you think of a shadow as two-dimensional. When we were up in the air, it almost took this three-dimensional shape to it. It was something that was awe-inspiring, and it's just wild to think of the celestial coincidence that allows all this to happen, but definitely a ride of a lifetime. Allison, back to you. Gotti Schwartz, thank you. Let's bring in solar astrophysicist from the Southwest Research Institute, Amir Kaspi. Amir, just listening to Gotti's joy and his reporting from the sky, talking about how it was a life-changing experience, he said, and such a reminder of just how fast the sun and moon are moving. For other people we've spoken to today, I'm, I'm one of them. It was also just an insane reminder of how small we are and how vast the universe is. But you do this stuff for a living. What does a day like today mean to you? 
you know, uh, we do this stuff for a living, but at the same time, this is just as transformative an event uh, as it is for everybody else. Uh, even though I study the sun every day, uh, this is actually only my second total solar eclipse wow. that I've been able to observe. And uh, it uh, it really is a magical experience. And there's nothing that can really describe it in any words other than the same ones you just heard from Gotti. Hmm. Uh, you have led multiple experiments during a past, or at least during another solar eclipse. Uh, there was one that you did with NASA, right? So talk to us about what you and other scientists hope to take away from witnessing and studying events like this. Uh, yeah, uh, during the last total solar eclipse, we ran a mission with NASA's WB-57 aircraft. So they fly even higher at about 50,000 feet uh, with cameras outfitted on their nose cones. Uh, we did that same experiment along with two other experiments led by other research teams this year with the WB-57s. Uh, we uh, among uh, we had an experiment that uh, there were also a lot of other experiments doing citizen science uh, or participatory science where uh, students and uh, non scientist amateurs participate in doing scientific research. Uh, our experiment was called Citizen Kate 2024, uh, but there were uh, probably over uh, half a dozen other big citizen science events. What we really hope to study is the solar corona, the sun's outermost atmosphere that you can only see during a total solar eclipse. And uh, solar eclipses really give us that unique opportunity to study that sun's tenuous outermost atmosphere to learn really important questions uh, about things like why the solar corona is so hot uh, it's millions of degrees, which is a lot hotter than the solar surface, which is only a few thousand degrees. Uh, and also how the corona puts out a constant stream of particles called the solar wind that then come out into interplanetary space and can affect us here on Earth. Hmm. So what does tomorrow and the next couple weeks look like for someone like you? I mean, the universe is so vast and I'm always amazed when I see these little snippets of, oh, scientists have discovered and figured this out about maybe this has changed on what we thought we knew about black holes, all these different things. But I'm also an English major, so sometimes it just goes totally over my head. So what does tomorrow and the coming weeks look like for someone like you in your studies and for people who were maybe also English majors like me, why should they care about these events beyond just, wow, it was mesmerizing to see? Those are very good questions. So, you know, for the next few weeks, in fact, probably for the next few months, maybe even years, we, uh, meaning me, my team, and other scientists, uh, are going to be taking all of the data that we gathered through our various experiments today and analyzing that data to see what we can uncover about the sun's solar corona or the Earth's atmosphere and how it responds to uh, the solar eclipse. Or there were also experiments that were studying how animals respond to the solar eclipse. Everybody will be taking home that data and spending the next few weeks or months trying to figure out exactly what information they learned and what kind of questions they've answered. Hmm. And that's important uh, for a couple of reasons. One is really just the fundamental knowledge of it all. Now, you know, the sun is a star, as you mentioned. We live around a star. A lot of people forget that because it's just in the sky every day. But by studying our sun, our star, we can learn about these same kinds of physics and processes that happen everywhere else in the universe, around other stars, around other planetary systems, even around exotic objects like black holes and neutron stars. We can learn a lot about what happens there by studying our own sun. But our sun is also the source of what we call space weather. It's constantly putting out radiation, uh, both in the form of light and in the form of particles that comes out and comes into interplanetary space. And it affects us both in space with our satellites and our astronauts. And it also affects us here on Earth. The best way to understand space weather is to study where it starts, which is at the sun. Hmm. Amir Caspi, astrophysicist, you are brilliant and have such a cool job. We are glad you do it. And thank you for giving us some of your time tonight. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much. OK, so for many of us, myself included, today was the first time we've ever really experienced such a phenomenon. But for Letitia Ferrer, it was her 21st and counting. I chatted with her about her decades long hobby. 
All right, guys, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Who's excited? The eclipse is coming. The eclipse is coming. The eclipse is coming. 63-year-old Letitia Ferrer hasn't missed a solar eclipse since 1998. This is flares from the sun. Including today, she's seen 21 solar eclipses. It's an embodied experience. It's not just, it's above you, around you, and within you. On seven continents around the world, and even a couple major oceans. And I did one in the 2005, was in the middle of the Pacific for a 30-second eclipse. And it makes me feel immense sense of gratitude for even being here. At the same time, like a little itty bitty ant, because this is going to happen with or without me. This time, she didn't have to travel very far to see the eclipse. Her home state of Texas was directly in the path of totality. It made it more special because I, quite frankly, instead of spending my time planning for the eclipse and just saving up money for it, I basically have spent my time doing outreach. And I'll tell you, my 90 year old parents were with me on this one. It was awesome. Some of Letitia's hardest life moments have happened since she began eclipse chasing. If life is, can be surprising to you. In 2010, she lost her first husband. And in 2017, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Letitia says she was supposed to have a procedure, but she postponed it because there was an eclipse. It was for me the right decision. It was my choice to pursue my life the best way I can. And yeah, we take risk every day. And you are cancer free now? I'm cancer free now after seven years. Now, Letitia shares her love and knowledge of eclipses with her second husband, Daniel. You know, I just love watching her up there, watching her do her thing. Followers of her podcast, Totality Talks, and students around the state of Texas. Like you're just the sun. And if you're wondering what's next for Letitia, don't worry. She's mapped out all of the solar eclipses till 2060. Honestly, I want everybody to follow their passion. For me, it's the total solar eclipses. And I, if you see one, I hope you understand why, but whatever your passion is, follow it. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. Up next, a deadly shooting in a Las Vegas law office today. Police say three people were killed, including the shooter. NBC's Steve Patterson will have the details. Plus, the president announces new plans to help millions say goodbye to student loan debt. And later this hour, running down a dream, a British man manages to run the entire length of Africa. That's about 10,000 miles, and he's done it in just under a year. His incredible story is coming up, so stay tuned. It's 352 days in a row. It always is building, it's constant, and it, you know, there is no let off. Welcome back. The latest on a deadly shooting in Las Vegas is straight ahead. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. An appeals court judge has denied Donald Trump's bid to delay his hush money trial. The criminal trial is supposed to start in New York next week. The former president's lawyers argued an impartial jury is basically impossible to find because of the publicity around the case. It will be the first criminal trial of a former president centered on charges that Trump falsified business records related to hush money payments. Jonathan Majors will avoid jail time after he assaulted his ex-girlfriend. The actor instead getting probation during a sentencing hearing today. The judge said he has to undergo a year-long in-person counseling program. He faced up to a year behind bars after he was convicted of assault back in December. Containers are beginning to be removed from the ship that hit the Key Bridge in Baltimore. Officials will now be able to access a portion of the roadway that collapsed, and once pieces of the bridge are removed, they can then move the ship. That would allow authorities to reopen the port to some traffic. A suspect has been arrested in connection to the fire at Senator Bernie Sanders' Vermont office. A 35-year-old man from California was charged with starting a fire that damaged the senator's office. Security video showed the suspect entering the building and igniting the blaze on Friday. Sanders was not there at the time, and luckily, no one was hurt. There's some troubling video in Virginia of an apparent street takeover. An officer there was hurt, getting hit by a car as hundreds of people swarmed and damaged police cruisers. Drivers were seen doing donuts, with one person even carrying an assault-style gun. Police now say they are cracking down to try and stop these street takeovers.
In Las Vegas tonight, we are learning more about a deadly shooting at a law office there. According to police, the shooter is dead after killing two people. Sources familiar with the investigation tell NBC News that a lawyer shot another lawyer and his ex-daughter-in-law. It happened during a deposition involving, allegedly, the shooter's son, who survived. NBC's Steve Patterson is following this for us from Los Angeles. Steve, what more do we know about what led up to this shooting? Uh, Allison, there really isn't another word for it. This is a tragedy all the way down, starting with the fact that this is another American shooting inside a workplace as Monday morning is starting. This is, happens in Summerlin, Nevada. It is a suburb of Las Vegas, maybe about 10 miles off of the Vegas Strip or so. It's this massive, massive office park, six stories or so. Inside there, on the fifth floor, there is a law firm. Inside that law firm, a deposition is going on between attorneys and the parties that they're representing. It is in this deposition that the shooting takes place. Here's what we know based on sources close to the investigation, close to the matter. They tell us that the shooter, as you're mentioning, the shooter is defending or uh, uh, representing, I should say, his son in the deposition. The son is in the room, the father of the son representing his son in the room as well, along with the shooter's uh, ex-wife and her husband, the husband representing his ex-wife. So you have this sordid family affair, but the son, the only person who isn't shot in this room, essentially watches his father shoot his ex-wife and her husband and then shoot himself. This all happens in a very close time period. Uh, it happens, again, during the middle of a workday, something like 10 o'clock in the morning, and police are continuing to investigate. But obviously, a tragedy for all involved, especially this family, as this all happens, again, mm. in one room. Wow. Allison? Horrific. Steve Patterson, thank you. We appreciate it. Country music star Morgan Whalen has been released from a Tennessee jail after he was arrested for allegedly throwing a chair from the top of a downtown bar. Police say Whalen picked up the chair and threw it over the sixth floor roof of a downtown Nashville bar last night. The chair missed two officers below by feet. That is according to arrest records. His lawyer says he is, quote, fully cooperating with authorities. NBC's Kathy Park joins me now. So, Kathy. What else are police saying and have we heard from the bar owners in this case? Well, Ellison, this was opening weekend for another country star's bar, Eric Church, and the bar happens to be right behind me, about a block from where we are standing. This is on Broadway, and according to the arrest affidavit, the incident happened just before 11 p.m. last night, and according to witnesses and surveillance footage that officers were able to comb through, uh, Wallen apparently, allegedly, is seen grabbing an object, a chair, and throwing it from the roof of the bar. And as you mentioned, the bar is pretty high. It's about six stories high. And the chair fell and narrowly missed uh, the two officers who were on Broadway. This could have been a lot worse, Ellison, because if you've been to Broadway here in Nashville, this is where the action is. There are a lot of restaurants and bars. This happened on a Sunday night, but there was still a lot of foot traffic in the area. And according to folks who live and work in downtown Nashville, I'm told that it's incredible no one got injured, but Wallen uh, was arrested. He was released early this morning. His bond was more than $15,000, and his court date is set for May 3rd now. So Morgan Wallen is a huge country star. I mean, has just dozens and dozens, it seems, of number one hits. But this is not the first time he's made headlines for something other than his music, right? Yeah, so if you're a country music fan, uh, you probably have heard of Morgan Wallen. In fact, heading to Nashville here, I heard him on the radio a couple of times. Uh, but yeah, he has uh, been caught in several controversies. In fact, in 2021, you might remember, he um, was seen on social media or actually on video shouting a racial slur outside of his Nashville home. And this temporarily um, halted his career, almost derailed his career, quite frankly, because his record label at the time decided to suspend him briefly. And then again in 2020, um, right before he was supposed to appear on SNL, he was seen on social media breaking COVID protocols, just 
partying too hard. He admitted that he was partying too hard. And um, he did later appear on SNL and kind of poked fun um, at his reputation. But those are some of the things that we have been following throughout his career. Um, and then we have this incident most recently that happened over the weekend. So with this most recent incident, Kathy, do we know if he's going to appear in court anytime soon? Yeah, so um, he was arrested um, and he was released early this morning. His bond was more than $15,000. Um, right now, his court date is set for May 3rd. Um, and coincidentally, Ellison, he's set to perform that same week right across the street here um, at Nissan Stadium that week as well. Uh, but that's all we know at this point. Um, very few details as to what led up to this incident, what prompted him to allegedly throw the chair from the roof behind me. Mm. Ellison? Kathy Park in Nashville. Thank you. Coming up, the Biden administration just announced another plan to forgive student debt for millions of Americans. We'll explain how it would work. But first, you've got to see this. This school bus in Mississippi was basically cut in half by a giant tree. Luckily, no one was hurt. The driver had just dropped off the last student on his route about five minutes before the bus was just crushed. When the driver looked into the rearview mirror, he saw a tree in the middle of the bus. That is a miracle that everyone is safe. Those pictures are unbelievable. We will be right back. Welcome back. President Biden has a new plan to clear out student loan debt for millions. Those details are straight ahead. But first, here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. Several homes were damaged after a fire broke out in Phoenix. It happened overnight. Luckily, no one was hurt. Fire crews rushed to put out the blaze that engulfed new housing developments. At least 75 firefighters were on the scene. Right now, it's unclear what caused the fire, but an investigation is underway. A popular park in Washington state has become a hot spot for a deadly, highly contagious virus known as Parvo that's mainly spreading to dogs. There's been at least 10 cases so far with one dog dying because of the virus. It spreads by direct or indirect contact and causes dogs to suffer from vomiting and diarrhea. And staying in Washington, dramatic video shows a man almost getting run over in his own driveway after confronting a thief. You can see the man tackling the suspect who was trying to get to a getaway car. That's when the driver rammed into him, taking him for a ride on the car's hood and crashing into his pickup truck. He miraculously was okay, but he will have to replace his truck's doors because of the damage. Over in Wisconsin today, President Biden announced plans to provide student debt relief, which could impact up to 30 million Americans. I will never stop to deliver student debt relief on hardworking Americans, and it's only in the interest of America that we do it. And again, it's for the good of our economy. This new proposal comes after the Supreme Court struck down the administration's original plan of canceling up to $20,000 for about 43 million eligible borrowers. NBC's senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has more. Hey there, Ellison. Yeah, the Biden administration feels that this could have an impact with millions of Americans, especially younger voters. And as you mentioned, up to 30 million Americans might be impacted by this and other measures that the Biden administration has taken over the last few months. Now, Ellison, you'll remember that uh, just last year, the Supreme Court struck down a broader measure to eliminate student debt that the Biden administration wanted to push through. In that case, the Supreme Court said that there was no legal legal justification for that executive order. Well, now the Biden administration is trying a different tack. They're using a different legal justification, a law passed back in the 1960s that gave broader powers to the education secretary when it came to reducing student debt. However, re some Republicans oppose elim eliminating this debt, and so it's likely to see legal challenges. Now, the White House says that it plans to or hopes to implement these changes by this fall just in time for the general election. Here's how it'll work. It'll affect people who have had student uh, interest, debt interest accrue uh, over many years. And especially this could affect those people that have been paying their student loans for 20 years, for more than 20 years for undergraduate loans and more than 25 years uh, for graduate loans. Now, again, this could impact millions of people, especially those younger voters, as uh, President Biden is facing a 
mounting outrage over the Israel-Hamas war. Recent polls have shown former President Trump doing much better with the voters ages 18 to 29 than he did uh, back in 2020. And so the White House, again, is trying to uh, do this as a way of fulfilling a campaign promise and hopefully get uh, some student debt relief to 30 million Americans. Back to you. Gabe Gutierrez in Wisconsin. Thank you. Former President Trump taking a stand on abortion tonight, saying that abortion laws should be left to the states. He made the announcement in a four and a half minute video that he released on his social media site, Truth Social. Trump's stance got a reaction from President Biden and his fellow Republicans who are pushing for a nationwide federal ban. Here's senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake. Tonight, after weeks of hints, former President Trump weighing in on abortion, declining to call for a national ban, instead saying it should be up to states to decide on any restrictions. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. Also stating his own view. I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest and life of the mother. Mr. Trump's announcement creating intense bipartisan backlash. Donald Trump just endorsed every single state ban on reproductive care nationwide. If MAGA Republicans put a federal ban on his desk, he'd sign it. Donald Trump is the reason Rose ended. If you reelect me, I'll be the reason why it's restored. While Mr. Trump's former VP, Mike Pence, slamming him for not calling for a national ban, writing, quote, President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020. The Supreme Court, with three Trump-appointed justices, struck down Roe v. Wade in 2022, returning the issue to the states, where some now have near-total abortion bans. Others have no restrictions. I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. But just 36% of Americans support the overturning of Roe, according to an NBC News poll. And the issue has energized Democrats. For Mr. Trump, today's announcement is the latest step in a long public evolution on abortion. I'm very pro-choice. I'm pro-life. We will agree to a number of weeks which will be where both sides will be happy. Our thanks to Garrett Hake for that. Still to come, a story that might make you feel like you need to work out. We're going to introduce you to a man who decided to run the entire length of Africa, all for a good cause. That's next, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. More than 100 people, including children, have died after a ferry boat capsized off the northern coast of Mozambique. Officials say the fishing boat was not licensed to transport people, yet it was carrying 130 people. State broadcasters say passengers were fleeing a cholera outbreak. 20 people are still missing. Over the weekend, China's military said it conducted air and sea patrols in the South China Sea in response to naval exercises by the U.S. and its allies. A day before, the group announced they would hold joint exercises in the sea to uphold the right to sail through and fly over the waters. One of the allies, Philippines, has had previous disputes with China over the territory, which is also a major shipping route. China says the U.S. is increasing tensions by meddling in the disputes. Houthi forces in Yemen said they launched rockets and drones at British, U.S. and Israeli ships. It's the latest attack on shipping in support of Palestinians in the Israel-Hamas war. Officials did not give a lot of details on the attack, only saying that they took place in the last 72 hours. And today, the Vatican declared gender-affirming surgery and surrogacy as threats to human dignity. The office issued a 20-page declaration that's been five years in the making and was approved last month by Pope Francis. The Vatican says the, quote, gender ideologies are on par with abortion and euthanasia as practices that they say reject, quote, God's plan for human life. At the same time, the document also takes aim at specific countries that criminalize homosexuality. 
New developments in the Israel-Hamas war today, which has been going on for six months now. The U.S., along with Egypt, has been trying to broker a deal between Israel and Hamas. The deal would get 40 hostages released in return for a six-week ceasefire. There's a lot still unclear about this potential deal, but it comes as IDF is saying that it has reduced its military presence in southern Gaza. NBC's Hala Gorani has more. There have been conflicting reports about whether or not we are close to any kind of ceasefire deal between the warring parties after a weekend of talks in Cairo. We understand from Hamas representatives who've been quoted in the media that there is still no breakthrough. However, Egyptian media are quoting um, participants in the talks who have said that, in fact, there is cause for cautious optimism at this stage. What would a ceasefire deal look like? How long would it last? Would it lead to the release of all of the hostages? That is still very much a series of open questions. Now, this is happening against the backdrop of significant military maneuvers by the Israeli army, the IDF announcing that it has withdrawn all of its ground troops from southern Gaza, leaving a single brigade in the north to secure and hold that part of the besieged enclave as well as the road that is cutting the Gaza Strip in half bifurcating the territory between north and south. Meantime we're keeping a close eye on the Israeli government promise of opening more aid crossings to deliver food and other essential supplies uh, to the hundreds of thousands of people still stuck in northern Gaza. The World Health Organization and other humanitarian groups have said that there are many people in Gaza that are near, in a near famine situation and that getting food and supplies to them is a matter of urgency. Hala Garani, thank you. Turning now to a story of inspiration. A 27-year-old British man, self-proclaimed as the hardest geezer, has run the full length of Africa over the course of a year, making him the first person to ever do so. Dozens of runners and fans flew in to join the final leg of his 10,000-mile journey. Our friends at Sky News have this story. The moment a mammoth mission was accomplished, the length of Africa run as never before. Yeah. One epic year-long journey over. How did Ross Cook even find the energy to celebrate? Appreciation for all the adulation. Unlike anything imagined when this endeavor began last April, a draining and dangerous journey, more than 100 days longer than hoped. But after so long solo, a support cast for the final leg. Yeah, all right. <laughs> How are we all doing? Yeah, yeah. Everyone ready to run a marathon? Yeah. 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 Right, let's do it then. And we join the journey into history. To be fair, a bit tired, but uh, one more day, one final push, get this thing done. How about you seem so calm and relaxed uh, with all the energy? Yeah, I've had, I've had a few tears this morning, so I've got it out of my system. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to make sure we're going the right way. Does anyone know? I couldn't get off work. Through the Tunisian countryside. I didn't go in the office that much. Dozens flew in to join the final 47k. You don't look like a man who's spent a year on the road, more than 10,000 miles. Yeah, it's quite a lot, actually. Honestly, yeah, it's crazy. And like, how can you be tired when there's this many people running with you? Do you know what I mean? It's so much energy. Do you feel the hardest geezer? Ah! <laughs> Good luck. A final marathon and more on the final day ending on the shores of the Med. After 352 days, Russ Cook is completing his extraordinary endeavour, running the length of Africa. Hard to keep up with approaching the finish line, even though he's the one who's run more than 385 marathons in a year. You know, I just ran my first 10K in five years on Tuesday last week in preparation for this, and I was just like... Do whatever it takes, get out of here, be a part of it. I think for me, the realisation that my wife got pregnant, had a baby, we now have a two-month-old, in the time he's done this. What was the hardest moment? Oh, so many difficult ones, man. I think the biggest thing is that it's just... It, it's 352 days on the road. It always is building, it's constant, and, it, you know, there is no let-off. So, yeah, it's amazing to finally finish. More than £600,000 has been raised for charity. This unprecedented quest across the continent complete. 
Africa run from its southern to northern tips. Just don't tempt Russ Cook to swim home. Rob Harris, Sky News at Ras Angela, northern Tunisia. Tesla settling in its highest profile trial yet, centered around the 2018 wrongful death from its controversial automated driving system. The suit was filed by the family of a former Apple engineer who died after his Tesla Model X veered off of the highway going 71 miles per hour. An NTSB investigation found that the autopilot function was on for almost 19 minutes before the crash. Details on the settlement have yet to be released, but Tesla will now avoid a lengthy jury trial, which would have focused on how its technology played a role in the crash. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to talk about Tesla's latest move. So, Danny, a settlement is not an admission of wrongdoing, but a lot of people make that assumption when someone settles, especially if it's a high-profile company like Tesla. So why do you think they decided to settle instead of fighting this and defending their technology in a jury trial? For the same reason, all parties settle in almost all civil cases. The reason is both the plaintiff and the defendant here, Tesla, simply don't want to shoulder the risk of going to trial, flipping a coin, and either for the plaintiff getting a zero, a defense verdict, or if you're Tesla, getting hit with a massive verdict that will also serve as a signal to all other would-be plaintiffs that you can sue Tesla, bring it on. This way, it's kept secret, and Tesla can buy out its risk. It doesn't have to undergo the risk it would face at trial. So what could this settlement mean when it comes to precedent for autopilot technology? Could it actually have an impact? It should mean zero for precedent, at least legally, and that's exactly why companies like Tesla settle. They don't want a court record of a verdict. It, verdict, and Tesla will also companies like Tesla will often pay more than they otherwise would to keep the settlement terms confidential. No surprise here that that appears to be exactly what Tesla is doing in this case. You pay a little extra for the premium of having the plaintiff agree to do all of the settlement terms in secret, and then you don't send a signal to the rest of the world and you create no judicial precedent. It's as if the parties both walked away, they privately settled this case, so there is no judicial precedent. Now, is there a spiritual or a business precedent? Sure, possibly. I mean, does this send the signal that if you sue Tesla, they'll settle? Well, maybe. But on the other hand, in this case, they only settled on the courthouse steps on the eve of trial. So uh, if you can shoulder the burden as a plaintiff and the financial uh, difficulties of suing Tesla and taking it all the way to trial, well, then maybe you have a shot. Hmm. All right. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, thank you as always. We appreciate it. And finally, we are going to end this hour on today's big story, that history-making solar eclipse. It was a once-in-a-generation event that reunited a group of former students with a once-in-a-lifetime teacher. NBC's Hallie Jackson takes us to Rochester, New York, where a retired junior high science teacher made good on a promise for decades in the making. It's so good to see you. They're all grown up now. How are you? I am so happy to see you. But to his former oh students. God. Fritz Killian. Mr. Moriarty. You animal. <laughs> so are you. Pat Moriarty will always be Mr. Moriarty, their former earth science teacher at Spry Junior High in Rochester. That's where, in his first year teaching in 1978, he flagged his students about an eclipse way down the road in 2024, inviting them all back to watch together. I said, hey, why don't you circle this April 8th, 2024 eclipse? And you know what? We're going to get together on that. And you said that in 1978? 78. And my kids looked at me like I was crazy. He did the same thing every year for the next 16 years, every class. Then, some four decades later, posted a reminder online. Yeah. Good to see you, too. That's when this happened. Rick Mintz, class of 79. Chuck O'Brien, class of 1982. Andrea Malafieu, class of 1988. One by one, they showed up. Rick Mintz. Oh, Rick. Holy cow, Rick. How you doing, buddy? You look different, man. Yeah. Yeah. Dozens, just for the pre-party. How many of you haven't seen Mr. Moriarty, Pat, 
since you left high school. Wow. <laughs> you came back just for this. Did your surgeon think you were crazy for yeah. postponing your knee surgery yes. for this party? Yes, he did. He tried to convince me that my knee was more important, but he doesn't know Mr. Moriarty. <laughs> now, today, more than 100 of his former students are by his side from Rochester and beyond, way beyond. A few flying in from Boston, Minneapolis, Virginia, and Detroit. Some dressed for the occasion. Look at those Moriarty Eclipse t-shirts. When I had these kids, they were ninth graders, and ninth graders wear a teenage mask, and they don't let you know that you're getting through. And now they're adults, and the mask is off. And now all of a sudden, the, the, the things you said and the stories that they were telling were so amazingly emotional. Mr. Moriarty's impact on me was to kind of really confirm my interest in science, and now I'm a teacher. Along with teaching biology, I'm teaching earth science. So it has really come around. A once in a generation moment for a once in a lifetime teacher. It's not about the eclipse. It's about you guys being here to share this time with my family, me and each other. Educators, every educator, I wish every educator had this. I am so privileged and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Kendra. So um, is there going to be a test on Friday? <laughs> To have them actually show up and, and be a part of uh, uh, this day and this event and uh, sharing memories with their friends and introducing their families and talking about their lives, I, it, it means so much more than the eclipse. How cool is that? Hallie Jackson, thank you for that. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.